Today's presentation will be given by Professor Marty Powers, the Sally Michelson Davidson Professor of Chinese Arts and Cultures at the University of Michigan, and former director of the Lieberthal Rogel Center for Chinese Studies. Of course, in those days, it was not the Lieberthal Rogel Center for Chinese Studies. In 1993, his art and political expression in early China was published by Yale University Press and received the Levinson Prize for the best book in pre-20th century Chinese studies. His pattern and person, ornament, society, and self in Classical China was published by Harvard University Press in 2006 and was also awarded the Levinson Prize in 2008. So he's an, among a small, must be a very small group of people who have gotten the Levinson Prize twice. In 2009, he was resident at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, writing a book on the role of China in the cultural politics of the English Enlightenment. And together with Dr. Catherine Xiang, he is co-editing the Blackwell Companion to Chinese Art. Today he will be speaking on Beyond Western Civilization, a Translingual Approach. Uh, please let, join me in welcoming him. Uh, good afternoon. I'm um, always uh, very honored uh, to stand here because of the long and glorious tradition of brown bags going back about half a century, more or less. Uh, so many eminent people have stood here, and I uh, look forward to learning a lot from the many experts uh, in the audience. Um, it reminded me, oh yes, I have a class at one o'clock, so I may have to speak and run. Alfred just reminded me of that, thank, thankfully. Okay, I'm not actually going to talk a lot, oh, sorry, uh, this doesn't work like that, yeah. A lot about um, um, civ text myself, Western civ text. Um, the critique uh, has been made by others. Um, you know, these texts sometimes embody a Whiggish and highly idealized account of European history. Jack Goody sees the narrative as both biased and self-serving, and I'll let him speak. These arguments put forward by those I shall refer to as Europeanists are problematic in several senses. Since they are largely self-congratulatory, that is, viewed from the standpoint of those who see themselves as benefiting from the miracle, indeed bringing it about, they are, the first, they are in the first instance directed internally, looking at factors uh, hopefully unique to Europe. There are clearly two pitfalls, he says, in this approach related to the argument's ethnocentric point of departure, namely the pitfalls of overestimating the uniqueness and of overestimating the miracle. Uh, of course, Goody isn't the only uh, critic of Western exceptionalism. Uh, Bin Wong, Ken Pomerantz, James Lee, the California school, in other words, Craig Clunas in my neck of the woods, and uh, of course our own David Porter, Christian DePay, the many uh, have uh, offered, uh, have contributed to such a critique. Uh, so today I'll focus on the putative uniqueness of uh, human rights concepts in the West, uh, such as those attributed to uh, Charles-Louis de Secondo, uh, Baron de Montesquieu, in case you didn't know about his rank. Uh, textbook version, okay, Montesquieu regarded despotism as a pernicious form of government, corrupt by its very nature, ruling as he wishes and unchecked by law. The despot knows nothing of moderation and institutionalizes cruelty and violence. And of course, uh, Montesquieu did think uh, China was sort of the quintessential despotic uh, government. <clears throat> to safeguard liberty from despotism, Montesquieu advocated the principle of separation of powers. Okay, the only problem is liberty for Baron Montesquieu meant inherited privileges, especially those of the nobility, not universal rights. And despotism, following 17th century practice, referred to a government without aristocracy, or a government where the nobility were stripped of their privileges. In other words, the United States today is a despotic government, according to that definition. In Europe, everybody knew about checks and balances after the 1735 publication of L'Esturgeon's Complete Universal History, where he describes China's system of checks and detail, uh, which was discussed uh, a lot by intellectuals thereafter and before Montesquieu. So you'll find that Jonathan Israel's views on Baron Montesquieu's conservative political thought do not rem resemble at all the Western Civ textbook narrative. I encourage you to look at that. Now, how to improve the situation? Uh, following the recommendation of Frederick Dahlmeier, we might recognize issues of justice as perennial issues in all human societies. That seems to me like a good place to start. Uh, we might acknowledge similarities in Chinese and European historical experience where they occur rather than suppress them because we postulate a priori a fundamental difference. This can be accomplished by adopting a structural approach. 
We might employ translingual and transvisual analysis, which is mainly what I want to talk about, and of course avoid Cold War sophistries such as anachronism. So today we'll look at a structural model. Uh, we'll consider the discourse and practice of political authority, equality, and individual conscience, Han de Song, and examine English and European responses uh, to those discourses and practices. So Charles Tilley's research suggests that there are basically uh, two options for distributing social rewards, namely sorting systems, which sounds like a fancy term for meritocracy, and inequality generating systems. And you'll see that in sorting systems are individual. That's the characteristic. Tilley states that most inequality generating processes do not conform to the sorting model. Uh, and here I paraphrase to save time. The reason is that inequality generating systems typically are based on the social surroundings in which people grow up rather than individual characteristics. As such, the resulting differences do not vary continuously, which is to say individually, but bunch categorically by gender, nationality, ethnicity, race, and so on. Now, this reminds me actually of um, a point made by uh, Benedict Anderson. Most of you have probably read this in which he points out that though nationalism appears late, and therefore we might think of it as modern, it's not actually a very modern way of thinking. Uh, it would, I think, he says, make things easier if one treated it as if it belonged with kinship and religion, uh, those, like those categories Tilly was just talking about, rather than with liberalism or fascism. Why? Because kinship, religion, and nationalism assign value on the basis of group membership. Liberalism and fascism are ideologies chosen voluntarily by individuals. Meritocratic systems then focus on individual variables among persons. Inequality generating systems distribute social advantages according to group membership, where that membership is not voluntary. You're born into a Catholic family or a noble family or whatever. <clears throat> Seeing as the Chinese invented meritocracy, this would suggest that they had to focus on individuals contrary to folk belief. In fact, I argue in the Harvard book that that's what gives rise to uh, bureaucracy. It was this problem they were trying to solve. You see, in inequality generating systems, you can predict a person's characteristics because you assume everyone in the group has the same characteristics, right? Uh, all nobility are noble, all commoners are common. You don't have to know about individual qualities. But in sorting systems, persons are regarded as individuals and therefore their personal characteristics cannot be predicted from group membership. You have no way of knowing what their uh, talents might be. And that gives rise to a need for a system for determining individual talent, and we call that bureaucracy. Oops. Now in China, this begins with Mozi. And notice what he does here. He basically says, okay, here's what you want to do. You want to pay mind to promoting capable people and appointing officials on the basis of their uh, abilities. Uh, what you don't want to look at is, um, for example, uh, lineage or family relations. You don't want to look at uh, class or wealth. And you don't want, and it doesn't matter if you like the guy or not. Right? So here Mwanza separates individual performance from group membership. But he still thinks of, a sort of authority uh, in terms of wealth and nobility. And we'll see that's the same in Europe in the early modern period, uh, at first they, they think of political authority as, as nobility. Now the key to classical bureaucratic theory was self-determination based on performance, or what was called Mingshu theory. You establish an office's legal jurisdiction and duties in writing and appoint someone you suspect is qualified. Then you make your decision based on his actual factual performance. Shi. Now this means the authority for the appointment is not coming from the monarch. And that's exactly what Huainanzi tells us. Although there may be executions, it's not because of the monarch's wrath. Although there may be promotions, it's not because the monarch grants them. And then he summarizes, the people will know the true source of promotions and punishments. They will know that it all depends upon their own persons. It's not a favor from the monarch as was uh, ordinary European practice in the early modern period. So what's happened to political authority here? Mingshu theory divided authority into its abstracted legal description and its palpable execution. Because they could not predict if these two would match up, they had to develop measures for assessing the degree to which a man's performance remained up to par. 
These measures, too, were further subdivided according to specific facets of a man's talent and performance. By Han times, we find technical terms for such subsets of aptitude as personal talent and ability, learning and knowledge, or work efficacy. None of these qualities were in any way a function of group membership. They were all achieved rather than ascriptive. Uh, Guanza has a passage, actually many passages, that state this quite nicely. So again, you use statecraft and measures of performance. Uh, and as a result, um, people, in other words, people's family interests, which is, say, group interests, will be separate from their public role. Um, cl class will not be a factor, uh, nor will it matter whether you're uh, close to whether the monarch likes you or not. So this must be one of the earliest definitions of equality anywhere, namely that the same criteria apply to everybody. Although the Qin dynasty in principle adopted a meritocratic standard, they continued to assign guilt based on group membership. If one member of a family was guilty, all were guilty. An edict issued by Emperor Wen rejected that principle as tyrannical. Um, the 18th century English translation calls it cruelty, but the Chinese is actually closer to uh, tyranny. Now, Emperor Wen's edict was issued not long after a meritocratic standard had been adopted as official policy, but the principle in foreign meritocracy in this edict is the same. In either case, a person's official rank or guilt is determined on the basis of individual behavior rather than group membership. In bureaucratic theory, this is all based on a sharp distinction between office and officer, court and state, public and private. In Han times, the public-private binome occurs frequently in political essays and official memorials. My, my Yale book uh, translates lots of these. It's clear that the main uh, discursive frame for political issues was public-private. Uh, and Wang Fu summarizes this. The way the lord of a state carries out his rule is by conducting affairs with a mind to the public interest. When laws are promulgated in the public interest, there's no way for disorder to arise in the law. Now, the reason that flattering ministers try to benefit themselves is private interest, and when that happens, uh, public law is undermined. Um, these ideas uh, filter down uh, all the way to the village level, because we find in the tombs and shrines of um, village scholars um, similar types of concerns. Um, this uh, particular scene here, it's actually two stories. One has to do with Lao Tzu and Confucius. We're not going to discuss that. The other is Confucius and Xiang Tuo. And this is one of the most popular themes in uh, these shrines and tombs at this time. Uh, according to Huai Nanzi, Xiang Tuo was just a child of seven years, but when he questioned Confucius, he wasn't upbraided because his arguments were reasonable. And here we see the child. This is his roly-poly toy here. Uh, and he's, he's pointing at Confucius, looking right at him, and he's pointing, which in uh, Han pictorial art um, grammar, that means I'm talking authoritatively to you, okay? So they've reversed the normal situation. Uh, the kid's got the authority, and Confucius sort of, yeah, yeah okay, okay, you know, so, sort of, uh, all right. Uh, this was appealing to the local scholars because they had no social status. Uh, and they wanted to establish the principle that even though you didn't have high status, you could still participate in political discourse if your words were reasonable based on facts. Now, Ming's theory implied that officials must be capable of independent thought. Otherwise, there's, that's what talent is all about. Emperor Wen duly issued edicts protecting critical speech, which later on were treated as exemplary edicts. By the latter Han, Wang Chong took this right for granted don't have time to show you that essay, and acts of independent moral judgment were valorized on the walls of these local shrines, such as this one here, Liu Xiaohui, uh, Mencius and Confucius both mention it, but basically um, men were forbidden to touch uh, women, obviously, in ancient times, um, but uh, Liu Xiaohui saw a woman who was uh, like freezing and needed clothing, and so he, you could see he's putting clothing on her here, thereby breaking the taboo. Um, the bear up here is an emblem for courage uh, because he made up his own mind about what was the more important thing, her life or the, or the moral strictures. Likewise, there are quite a few scenes that show um, people who criticize tyrants or tyranny. Um, Zhao Dun is over here. That part of the stone is now damaged, but 
Zhao Dun criticized Duke Ling, who then tried to have him assassinated, uh, failed at doing that. But nonetheless, Zhao Dun was valorized by these local scholars uh, for speaking uh, crit critically and directly to his superior. Tang Taizong recognized the connection between meritocracy and individual conscience, commenting that if officers just accept policy as it comes and have no oppositional views of their own to offer, well, who wouldn't be qualified to, to as an official, right? Any jerk could do that, right? What would be the point of going to all the trouble of selecting talented men if you just have yes men? Bai Chi Yi, uh, drawing on classical bureaucratic theory, based his definition of equality on the recognition of individual conscience. According to the annals, he says, people's minds are all different, just like their faces. Therefore, one person, one point of view. A thousand persons, a thousand point of view. If you don't unite them with law, then each person's mind will differ entirely from every other. Now, I know what some of you may be thinking. You're thinking he's going to say, okay, people have different points of view. Now we're going to issue some laws that make everybody think alike. Well, that's actually the Western uh, method, Hobbes. That's, the, that's what Hobbes came up with. But uh, by GE, um, thought differently. For example, if laws are carried out strictly at first, but in a lax manner as time goes on, then they're not uniform, that is not equal. If laws are applied strictly to the poor, but loosely to the rich, and that never happens in this country, we know, it's, we're very lucky, then they're not uniform. If laws are enforced for people who are distant from the throne, but are not enforced for those near the throne, then they're not uniform. He's talking about equal here. Uh, an edict of 971 defining tenants and landlords as equal before the law was interpreted as establishing equality as a general principle. And you could see this in Hu Hong and Sima Guang both. Sima Guang remarked that both landlords and tenants as taxpayers are equal under the law. Now no one is in a position to lord it over the other in a uh, court. Uh, I think that's a pretty good definition. Um, Chi Chao Li's study of local uh, <clears throat> law, and sometimes many of the institutional practices reviewed in that book were based on the assumption that all taxpayers had individual views of policy and had the right to convey those views to the public or the government. I'm summarizing a couple pages of text here to save time. Should a taxpayer feel that a judgment was unfair or that her rights had been infringed, she could complain to the magistrate or use the grievance offices, which were under the Yishutai. Uh, she could also appeal the case to a higher level officer, such as a circuit inspector. In this case, the magistrate was forbidden to assume the case or place the suit in the hands of any colleagues in the county. All taxpayers in Song Times had the right to bring suits to court, including farm women. We have maids, you know, who sue their bosses. The charge to the grievance offices in the Song history, if you read it, states that memorials, it uses the technical term here, regarding policy or appointment and other issues can be submitted by civil officials, military officials, and ordinary taxpayers. According to Cracky's studies, this, this actually happened. I'm sure it wasn't perfect. Now, can visual documents tell us anything about how authority was understood for a given community? Of course, I'm biased. I'm an art historian. I think, yeah. In most traditional societies, political authority was understood as majesty displayed in clothing and deportment social status was not clearly distinguished from political authority and therefore you had to wear clothes that showed you had the status. Legal jurisdiction was not clearly distinguished from a lord's territory. Actually, Mozart talks about this. He and you know, someone asked him, you know, do, should I choose my clothing first and then participate and then, you know, exercise government or should I work in government first and then choose my clothing? Mozart says, Clothing isn't the issue. He says clothing doesn't matter. Only action matters. Now, you can see here, both in medieval China as in early modern Europe, clothing is very important. Uh, for Jackson, it's not important, not because that wasn't the fashion, but because, as far as I can tell, all, in all societies where hereditary authority declines, uh, so does uh, ornament on clothing. And so, in Song China, we have a different situation. Now, here, um, the Duc de Berry, okay, um, has a lot of political authority, but he doesn't have an office. He has a social status. He's a duke. He's not, say, magistrate or something like that. Um, this guy has a lot of authority. He is the chancellor of the Han Empire. That's a very high position. But you notice there's no embroidery on his clothing. Uh, he's just wearing very ordinary clothing. He he's kind of slouches. He doesn't stand 
in a noble fashion and so on. Uh, and in fact, this um, the reason the artist could do that is because he understood that the authority was in the office. It was not in his social status, so there was absolutely no need to represent social status. We don't even know what his social status was. He had the office that was the authority. And this story, it turns out, is about jurisdiction. Only the Chinese would paint paintings about jurisdiction. Okay. So Bingji was prime minister. One day he was touring the countryside and saw a riot in which several had already died, but he did nothing. Later he saw a farmer with an ox and noticed the ox was breathing hard. So he dismounted and inquired the far from the farmer about the ox. His subordinates were shocked at his callousness, but he explained that a riot falls under the jurisdiction of the local officials. But if the ox is breathing hard due to excessive heat, then there may be a drought and the people will suffer. This is the proper concern of the chancellor. Okay. Uh, this story was represented on lots of vases and things like that throughout Ming and Qing times. I think it was probably given as a gift. So because there was a sharp distinction between the officer and the office, authority was understood as a function of the office. The authority was in the in the zhi, not in the guan, and, and not social status. An office implied legal limits on jurisdiction, including term limits. This is why the Han Declaration that the monarch does not appoint officers remained current in Song discourse. Sima Guang, for every monarch, the key principle in governing is to promote those who are capable and to dismiss those who are not. No, the classic meritocracy. But then he goes on to say, when someone is given an official salary, it's the entire empire that gives it. It's not the case that the monarch grants it as a favor. And again, this is very different from early modern Europe, where it's always assumed the monarch grants these things as a favor. Now, several of the edicts and memorials cited today and to be cited were gathered together in a collection of exemplary political essays first assembled in Song times, actually a couple collections, as you see, and later expanded during the Kangxi era as the imperial collection of exemplary essays. This document can be understood as representing the Chinese view of the finest political thought in the tradition, a kind of great essays instead of great books. These were translated into French and English in the 1730s, although many of these principles were already available in the 17th century. Now, in these essays, meritocratic authority, equality before the law, service to the people, free speech, and the distinction between public and private are very common themes. Translingual analysis can reveal how Europeans understood these concepts. If equality and free speech are unique Western values, then Europeans should have had no difficulty understanding the difference between individual merit versus group-based privilege, right? Right? Okay. Well, let's look at Pufendorf, Samuel Pufendorf. After reading about Chinese uh, meritocracy in Newhoff's book, um, he says, uh, neither do the Chinese express any honor for antiquity of descent. The poorest and meanest person in the empire is capable by his learning only of preferring himself to the highest places of honor. He doesn't have a word for bureaucratic office. They don't have bureaucracy at that time. And so he concludes, nobility ought not to depend only upon the blood but should much rather be raised and established on virtue. Now, no, nobility here obviously is, stands in for political authority. That's the, what he's trying to express. And it's just as obvious that he could not imagine the concept of authority except as a function of group membership. He could not separate political authority from social status. And this is true throughout the 18th century. If Pufendorf could not even imagine political equality, Leibniz could but he regarded the idea itself as unimaginable. If equality were everywhere requisite, then the poor man would set up his claim to it against the rich man and the valet against his master. Oh my God, yeah, that, that's just unimaginable. We can't have that. Obviously we can't have something like that happen. So clearly he wouldn't uh, have been able to deal with Bai Ji's or Sima Guang's definition of equality. Now why was it so difficult for them to grasp these concepts? Well, for one, the concept of sovereignty was very different. As you can see, James I would not have approved of Jia Yi's uh, suggestion to Wendy that everyone should be allowed to complain about the government uh, because you can't complain because the monarch is absolute and whatever he says is right. Uh, well, he can be corrected, but only by God. Okay. And I, I haven't found any historical records of God coming down and correcting James I. But if you know of any, let me know. 
Uh, another is the concept, the European concept of equality. It was very different. Uh, it was based on the Aristotelian concept, as, as well as the great chain of being. According to Daniel Allen, uh, in his consideration of justice, Aristotle first reaches the conclusion that distributive justice is based on a geometrical principle of equality or an equality based on ratios. Translation, some people are more equal than others. Chief among the criteria for distribution of portions were honor and property. Now, guess who has more honor and property than the rest of us? The aristocracy. That's right. And this uh, system, of course, gives rise to what Jonathan Israel describes as the European situation uh, in the 18th century, uh, ruled by princes and nobilities and characterized by huge inequalities of wealth and legally buttressed privilege based on group membership. So what happened to the discourse of merit after Pufendorf? As late as 1732, a man publishes an essay uh, only as AD. He doesn't dare to sign his name because what he's talking about is too dangerous. But he suggests that no government ought to hinder the meanest member of the community from advancing himself by his own merit. Now here merit is beginning to mean something like what we're familiar with. And surely, all things being equal, that society must be the happiest, where honors and places of trust are only given to the deserving, where royal image is not stamped upon metal of base alloy. So clearly, he still sees authority as based in um, social status of the monarch who doles it out, but he does think marriage should be taken into consideration. Nonetheless, he balks at the idea that office should not be hereditary. You know, he still can't quite get his head around that one. Samuel Johnson uh, had a much better understanding. He wrote a review of Duald's uh, book, which includes the translation of these exemplary essays. Uh, and he clearly sees a distinction between um, nobility, which he means uh, political authority still, and, um, and privilege. So they're beginning to understand a, a difference between these two ideas. Uh, what about transvisual analysis? Can pictures tell us anything about how Europeans understood authority? Well, when Europeans created pictures of Chinese officials, they had to transmit the idea that these guys had authority, right? So how did they do it? We saw that in some times, there's no ornament because the artist understands that the authority is in the office. Here's an example from uh, uh, Kircher's uh, illustrations of sort of typical Chinese, and it's a military official. Now you can see, uh, I think this is generally true even in Ming and Qing times, that when, when Chinese represent soldiers, they usually show them as stout, robust, uh, determined. I mean, uh, would you want to go one to one with this guy? You know, you wouldn't. So um, that's, that's what they're trying to get across. But this fellow here uh, has this wonderfully elegant posture, <laughs> right? And, uh, and you wonder, what, what are they trying to say here? Well, I think what they're trying to say is uh, nobility. Okay, and this is how the nobility were portrayed, you know, just sort of these, these elegant postures. And he had to have that in there visually in order for people to understand that this guy has authority because authority is understood as nobility at that time. Uh, here's Kang Xi as Louis XIV. Now, the point is not to imply that people in China had a freedom-loving national character, because equality and justice, I believe, are perennial issues. There were calls for more genuine equality in England and elsewhere, uh, but prior to the 18th century, generally not by people of the stature of a Bai Juyi or a Sima Guang. But Sir John Eliot, uh, this is a very interesting paragraph, where he's clearly talking about individual qualities. Uh, he wrote this from prison, um, which tells you what, what liberal thinking would do for you in England. Uh, we shall endeavor to discover what true honor is. I think honor here is close to authority. And first to see whether it be confined within an order that is within a hereditary social rank, limited to persons and degrees, degree was the word for social rank, or left promiscuously to all. Promiscuous is very interesting. He didn't use equally. Why? Because we know what equal meant, right? He couldn't have used equally. So he uses promiscuously. It means without, without regard to this system of degrees as their worths and qualities shall discern it. Worth here clearly means individual worth. It doesn't mean class worth. And qualities too, the word quality at this time uh, did refer to class quality, like the quality of a nobleman, but he puts it in the plural, qualities, which makes it individual. Uh, let them answer who so magnify this pretense 
uh, pretense, it seems to me, anticipates um, false consciousness in some sense. Of course, now I'm starting to sound like a Western Civ textbook, but um, nonetheless, I think this is a really interesting paragraph. Um, and according to Daniel Allen, in 1625, the Scottish Calvinist George Buchanan argued that the people, all people, had a right to resist sovereigns. It is lawful not only for the whole people, but also for every individual to kill a tyrant. Uh, so there were such ideas, but you won't find those in Hobbes. Uh, you will find them in Mencius. Uh, the Mencius quote, of course, is what I call the Confucian escape clause. Uh, no, you may not kill a monarch. Yes, you may kill a tyrant. Okay. Tom Paine has an interesting role in all this. In 1739, the Whig journal The Craftsman recommended that England establish a system of checks similar to China's Yishutai, or what Cracky called information and rectification agencies. There's a pretty good description of this in Luce Dujon. James Roberts and the free thinkers made similar demands around the same time. This is long before Montesquieu. But afterwards, the authorities claimed that Parliament was a check upon itself. So in common sense, Thomas Paine refuted that view. To say that the Constitution of England is a union of three powers reciprocally checking each other is farcical. But I think you can find that in, in Western Civ texts. So in the first two chapters of Common Sense, we go back and read it. Payne demands, first of all, the institution of genuine checks in government. Secondly, taking the appointment powers of the king away and placing that power in the state. Eliminating the aristocracy and the principle of hereditary authority. Do these uniquely Western concepts remind you of anything? You had all that in China at that time, just in case you didn't know. Thomas Jefferson. Before we get to Jefferson, I'm going to talk about Sima Guang. Um, and a little essay he has uh, on meritocracy. It's a, um, <clears throat> uh, written to Renzon. Uh, here we see an, a picture of Sima Guang on a um, chinoiserie bowl um, created in Meissen, Germany uh, in the 18th century. And there's several, I've found at least four of these. Uh, for some reason, Sima Guang was very popular and I don't know why. So he says, lay yourself out to know those thoroughly whose virtue and capacity, tai de, are greater than ordinary and who are thereby most capable to answer the hopes of the public. And then it's standard meritocratic theory so that all people will feel its effects and you will build their happiness upon your wisdom. In other words, recruit honest, able, and public-spirited men so that government can promote the happiness of the people. This is standard um, bureaucratic thinking. Thomas Jefferson's bill for the more general diffusion of knowledge and whereas it is generally true that the people will be happiest whose laws are best and are best administered, and that laws will be wisely formed and honestly administered in proportion as those who form and administer them are wise and honest, once it becomes expedient for promoting the public happiness that those persons whom nature hath endowed with genius, tai, and virtue, blah, should be rendered by liberal education worthy to receive and able to guard the sacred deposit of the rights and liberties of their fellow citizens, that they should be called to that charge without regard to wealth, birth, or other accidental condition, in other words, without regard to group membership, right, based on their individual qualities, not group membership. In other words, recruit honest, able, and public-spirited men so that government can promote the happiness of the people. In order to foster a more equal society, Jefferson recommended eliminating primogeniture and establishing a graduated income tax. Both policies were rare in Europe, if practiced at all, I haven't found any instances, but had been standard in China since some times. So if many of China's policies were progressive relative to medieval and early modern Europe, why is it that we never hear about them? Cold War warriors employed many techniques for suppressing this kind of knowledge, but two were especially common. Now I could talk for hours about techniques for suppressing this stuff, but we only have time for two. First, anachronism. Scholars would dismiss progressive policies in China as meaningless in comparison with post-Kennedy, pre-Ashcroft American practice. And the second is similar. Yes, but it wasn't perfect, so it doesn't count. All right. I think we've all come across that one. Now, scholars of American and European history, and especially Western Civ textbooks, do not adopt that very high standard. They understand that no system has ever been perfect and therefore they focus on progressive ideas even if they were imperfectly realized. As one scholar of equality in America has written, one point is vital to acknowledge, like all the other principles espoused by the founders, equality under the law was not always observed in practice. Indeed, it was often violently breached from the very beginning of the republic. 
But even when the principle of equal treatment was betrayed, American leaders in every era have emphatically affirmed it, not so much out of hypocrisy as out of aspiration. Indeed, for those who were devoted to justice, the persistence of inequality was precisely what made equality before the law imperative. Over time, this principle would provide the roadmap for eradicating injustice. Uh, I, see, I don't have a problem with that. Bottom line, Huntington was wrong. Moza, Sir John Elliott, Sima Guang, Johnson, and Jefferson were all working for similar ends uh, within the constraints of their periods and, and using whatever resources they had available at the time. So let's end with an argument to the effect that most people everywhere and at all times can recognize injustice and that no amount of oppression can erase that consciousness from the mind. I'm quoting here, this isn't me. It is a common and true saying that there is in the universe a particle of unextinguished reason rooted in the heart of man, which being at all times the same, is the cause of certainty. Ever since the world has existed, there has been in it a good deal of disorder. It has increased to such a height in some periods that the laws have been without force, and the wicked have without dread or shame ventured everything. This, isn't, uh, this wasn't written yesterday, so don't worry. It's an old text. But this corruption never extinguishes, at least in a great many, the light of reason which condemns this disorder. These sentiments, which are, as it were, common and universal to all mankind, are the rays of light and natural reason. It is never extinguished, and whoever opens his eyes must perceive it. Now, is this a Chinese text, an English Enlightenment text, or both? I leave it to you to decide. Thank you. I have a, I have a class at one, but I have a few minutes. and it happens again and again and again in history, both in China and in, in Europe. The question is whether or not wealth and charm are, are institutionalized as privilege, right? That's the thing. So, um, I, like I tell myself, I'm not bothered by corruption. Corruption is a good thing, actually. Uh, well, by that, I mean if it's recognized as corruption, right? In other words, if, if uh, you know, Blagojevich, if that kind of action is recognized as corrupt, the fact that a hundred other guys got away with it is not so important as long as it's still recognized as corruption. But when it becomes a, a privilege, as it was in 17th, 18th century England, nepotism was perfectly normal, um, then then that's a problem because then you, you it's hard to get rid of that. Yeah. Did you shed some light on what the recent uh, occurrences in Hong Kong now? <laughs> um, <laughs> there are several experts here. I'm, I'm actually, I just came back from Hong Kong. I, I saw them. Um, but um, I, that's not my field of expertise. Uh, the only thing I'll mention, which might be relevant, is Charles Tilley, that essay I quoted at the beginning. He um, talks about elections, and, and he points out that in the latter half of the 20th century, um, a large number of uh, nations around the world, especially in Latin America and other places, adopted democratic systems. And by the end of the century, those systems had turned into oligarchies, where they retained the electoral process. So elections and democracy are not the same thing, necessarily. But that's all I have to say. I'm, there are people who really know what they're talking about here. I can't answer that. Yeah. Um, I, was, I always like your argument about with the Europeans not understanding what they learned about China. But I wonder whether by using uh, European notions of equality and aristocracy and rank and so on, may miss something in looking at earlier periods in China, whether it might be possible to think about, for example, the examinations in slightly different terms. Um, right, so in principle, everybody could participate, but literacy rates were you know, 5 percent, 10 percent of the entire population. Uh, so how do we think about that? And how do we think, for example, about uh, examinations in Korea, where participation 
in examinations was limited to the aristocracy, right. Right, where there was, on the one hand, some admission of individual difference, and at the same time also inscription. As, as happened in England in the late 19th century. Right. I'm really glad you asked that question, because um, first of all, I, I'm, again, I'm not thinking of this as China versus Europe as right. being fundamentally different. Right. So the system you have in early modern Europe is not that different from the Tang, as you know. Um, and in the Tang, you had examinations, but it was a joke. You could actually buy your grade, all right? Uh, again, as in England, bribery was legal. Uh, this was true in France also, 17th, 18th century France. You could eat the bribery in, in the courts was perfectly legal. Uh, Tang wasn't that different, which is why the Song historian, looking back on the Tang administration, is like, what was wrong with these people? You know, he doesn't even understand it. Because he says, you know, they had offices and they had officers, but they didn't match up, you know? So um, it's not about East and West. And in fact, in Tang China, uh, Liu Zongyuan mentions, uh, you know, Liu Zongyuan, like um, Tom Paine, wanted to bring down the aristocracy. He wanted to end the aristocratic system. And he mentions counter arguments that are very much like Montesquieu. Um, for example, the argument that the aristocracy will look out for the people better than the officials because they're, the, the people belong to them. It's their own dependence. Okay, that's a wonderful argument. Um, of course, Peter Ball discusses that argument in relation to China uh, in one of his articles. Um, but you, you see, here's, here's what happens with me. When I look at A.D., who doesn't even dare to sign his name, and all he's really saying is maybe, not always, kind of sometimes, we could give someone some political authority not based on blood. And he's afraid to even sign his name. And it's hard for Pufendorf even to imagine the concept. I'm not sure why those of us in some studies are so worried about the system not being perfect. You know, I'm, I'm not really bold. I never thought it would be perfect. I've never seen a perfect system in any historical uh, situation. So if, if, let's say, it worked only 10% of the time, and I think it probably did better than that, um, so what? That's 10% better than anywhere else in the world. So I think we should, uh, I think we're asking the wrong questions for the song. So I'm really glad you asked that, but that's my view. Uh, if you look at how Europeans responded to this, and supposedly they're the ones who think of equality and, and all this stuff, um, you know, they, what they did in the song was pretty impressive, I think. Um, to give another example, you know, you, you know, you, you're not going to, um, criticize Henry Ford because his cars didn't have crumple zones, right? And anti-lock brakes and things like, you know, I mean, we just wouldn't do that. But anyway, that's my view. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Professor Wicks. Uh, I would keep in mind with these Chinese uh, citations, a uh, uh, distinction between the uh, descriptive and prescriptive, sure. uh, or almost prescriptive, more aspirational. It's arguable that something like the emphasis in Mencius on on uh, not uh, look, uh, giving primacy to Lee, to self-advantage, underscores just how dominant in the society. Oh, certainly in, in Mencius time, for sure. Yeah, yeah Lee yeah. was. Right. And um, I, I just uh, throw that out because I think that there can be um, you yeah. know, some muddling of the those categories. Well, yeah, except that, um, you know, this is what our colleague in American history says, mm -hmm. right? In other words, neither, he doesn't think it was perfect and neither do I. I never said that. And, um, and nor did these guys. You know, if you read uh, Sima Guang, if you read mm -hmm. uh, Su Shi, Liu Zongyan, they know these institutions are not going to eradicate inequality. They know they're not going to eradicate corruption, but they think they're going to help. You know, so Ouyang Xiu, and I think they're right, it did help. If you look at the biographies of the Song officials, hardly any of them have noble blood. Whereas in England, they all do, okay? So I keep coming back to this, okay? In England, they all have noble blood. You cannot be a magistrate unless you are noble and Anglican. Those were the only two criteria, all right? So I think, you know, we don't want to compare it to Kennedy's America. We want to compare it to early modern England, early modern China, early modern England. And, and if you compare those two, uh, yeah, it wasn't perfect, but it looked an awful lot better. And but, but something like yeah. Wang Fu's discussion, this is, is part of a general discourse about how, how do you select able people? Right. And it seems to be a perennial one. 
And not mm -hmm. that people are selecting able people be, because well, that's what it's complaining about. Emphasize it so much. No, exactly, of course. But um, but you see, what a um, you know, I do discourse analysis. Okay, so for me, what is significant is not um, that the discourse doesn't describe uh, the reality because that's never the case, right? But rather how the argument is made. Okay. So in Han times, the argument is you is around public private, and indeed Wang Fu is talking about this because it's being violated. The principle is being violated, but that's how the argument goes. Just as if you look at blogs today about what's going on here, you'll see those same kinds of terms, right? Um, conflict of interest and so on, uh, double standard and so on. Well, I think it's important that that's the way the argument is made, rather than James the First, where, well, that's too bad. I'm the king. This is what I say. You see the difference? Yes. And you know, people do that with art too. You know, people. Uh, someone uh, on the East Coast, I won't mention the name, uh, wrote about um, this Chinese scroll, which, rep which illustrates Kai Feng. And she said, "Well, this is a work of propaganda. You know, it's trying to make it look as if, you know, the the government is is doing a good job and so on." And as an art historian, I'm like, "Duh." You know, <laughs> I mean, that's what art does, right? And, but there's a big difference between a portrait of Louis the Fourteenth, which says, "I'm, you know, I have authority because I have the right blood." You know, the fleur de lis is all all over his his clothing, right? And a painting, a court painting, which says. I have authority because look at what a good job I'm doing. You see the difference? These are different societies, mm -hmm. totally different societies. So, so the idea that, well, it wasn't <coughs> the way they describe it does not impress an art historian. Because I, I, I do discourse analysis. That's what I do. I'm interested in the lies. I, what's important is how did they lie, right? <laughs> yeah. So the a proposition that the, the Europeans looking at China, using a Chinese example, they already had made up their mind. They're looking for grist for the milk. So they pick the chunks that fit into their plan. Already. That's the traditional view. And then, right. well, I'm asking if you agree with that. Well, obviously not, because one, if, they, if that were the case, they would understand it. They would understand the mill they were grinding. No, there's no understanding involved. They see something that's useful to them. They don't care about context. They just slot it in. No, but you don't understand. They didn't understand. Okay. So if if, no, if they had Western, that, that, no understanding at all. Right. It does, doesn't have anything to do with understanding. Well, no, but what happens over time is indeed, as you saw, they do eventually understand. Jefferson understands. But they said that we do progress, right? Yeah. Well, oh, but, but but the Chinese are there all along. People are debating these texts but from 17, is, 1665 onward. Are there onward. examples where the China input really changing somebody's mind, rather enforce the direction, uh, help in the direction they're already headed in? Oh no. Well, okay. I I think I get what you're saying, and I got to go soon. Um, yeah. When Johnson pushes. Merit, his understanding of meritocracy, which is better than ADs, mm -hmm. sure, that's because he's a middle class guy and he wants to open up more opportunities for himself. That's always the engine. Yeah. So you notice I never use the word influence, right? Mm -hmm. I don't believe in influence. There's no influence. And that's why that last text I showed you, um, my answer is that it's both Chinese and, and uh, English Enlightenment. Okay? It, this is, uh, it was written by Chen Dexiu in the 12th century. It sounds like a typical Enlightenment text. And that's not because the English translator imposed these ideas. They're there, all right? But there are certain, but nonetheless, um, this, you know, it comes together at that time in the translation, 1738, uh, as a typical Enlightenment text. And so, yeah, I'm not talking about influence yet. So you're, I, I agree with you totally about that. But on the other hand, I don't buy the uh, post colonial notion that, you know, in the West, we had these ideas all along, and we just project them onto China. If that were the case, they would obviously understand it better. No, I'm not saying they yeah. have the full idea, but there, there's some similarity. And they well, no, they sure. They, to eat. That's right. That's right. They, they, you know, they see this as useful, and that's why it's mostly middle class guys who are. Who that's why distortion is very common, especially early on. Right. Right. I, I can go with that. David, we'll have to have a beer on this one because I got, I got to go to class. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.